Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Imagine you're living in the early 1900s. You're at home at night and you hear something unusual. It sounds like a tapping noise, but you can't quite place it. Then you hear wood cracking and then more tapping. And suddenly you realize someone is using a tool to remove your back door from the outside. This is the case of the New Orleans Axeman. Let's get into it. Nineteen eighteen. Post Civil War New Orleans underwent huge changes through the last part of the eighteen hundreds. Plantations were broken up and slavery was abolished, which had sent thousands of African Americans pouring into New Orleans as free people, celebrating their release from their captors and building their lives in the new area. In the early 1900s, the city of New Orleans is a mix of white, black, Creole, Jewish, and more, and the new music of the time, jazz, is thriving, rising out of the city's diversity and multiculturalism. I'm gonna leave you, Daddy, and I don't care who knows. I used to love you, but I'm getting tired of your kind. I used to love you. But I'm getting tired of your kind I'm going down south Just to see what I can find Jazz music was a symbol of youth and freedom and diversity that was born out of tough times in a tough city. Jazz music is still the heartbeat of New Orleans, but back at that time, it was also a topic of controversy as black Americans were creating it and playing it and making it popular, but Caucasian Americans were the ones recording it and making money off of it. Many people believe that a jazz music lover just might have been angry enough about this to kill. In 1918, the city becomes paralyzed with fear as a madman begins murdering citizens in their home. This killer became known as the Axe Man of New Orleans, and his legend seems to only grow with time. Uh, there was a lot of excitement in the city and uh, a lot of patriotic fervor going on. In the middle of all of this, for about an 18 months period, the city was also worried, plagued, and uh, in fear of a figure known as the Axe Man. There were 12 attacks during this uh, roughly 18 months period and six deaths. They were in people's homes while they slept in their own beds. The Axe Man didn't carry around his own tools, he simply would chisel his way in, usually through a back door, find whatever was handy, and go to work. This theory that the killer who came to be known as the Axe Man may have been angry about the injustice between black creators and white producers started when in 1917, an Italian-American named Nick LaRocca made the first jazz record and was credited for creating the Dixieland sound that had actually been created by black Americans. It's a theory not shared by everyone, but even for those who believe in it, is it really a reason enough to kill? Do the people like the Axe Man need reasons to kill? Or are they doing it out of pure evil? May 23rd, 1918. Joseph and Catherine Maggio are asleep at home. They are Italian immigrants living in New Orleans who work as grocers. 
While they are sleeping, a killer removes the back panel of the door to their home, creeps inside, and murders them with an axe, their own axe. He also uses a straight razor on them. The axeman leaves his bloody clothes at the scene, but takes nothing. The victims are later found by Joseph's brother, and the scene is so ghastly that police officers run from the home to be sick. June 27, 1918. Louis Bessemer and his mistress Harriet Anna Lowe were attacked in the early morning hours at home. A stranger broke in, carrying an axe, and struck both Louis and Anna. Again, the killer used the homeowner's own axe. Louis survived the attack. Harriet survived initially, but died seven weeks after surgery to attempt to correct paralysis in her face. Before she died, Harriet Anna stated that the attacker looked to be of mixed race. She used a word we don't use anymore, but police didn't know if she was reliable or not. A black man, Louis Ubicon, was arrested for this attack and then later released when there was no evidence supporting his guilt. August 5th, 1918. Anna Schneider, who was eight months pregnant, awoke to a man standing over her bed with an ax. She screamed as the man dropped the ax on her head, plunging it into her skull. She is very, very lucky, surviving the attack and giving birth to a healthy baby girl a few weeks later. August 10th, 1918. Another Italian grocer, an elderly man living with his nieces named Joseph Romano was attacked and brutalized with an ax. His two nieces found him wounded and unconscious and actually saw the attacker fleeing the home. They described him as a dark-skinned, heavy-set man who wore a dark suit and a slouched hat. Joseph Romano died two days after he was attacked. March 10, 1919. Charles Cordomiglia and his wife Rosie are attacked. Rosie is holding their sleeping toddler, Mary. Charles and Rosie both survive. The baby does not. Rosie then goes on to falsely accuse her landlords of the attack, and the men are sentenced to hang. Charles actually divorces his wife over these accusations because he knows they're not true, and Rosie later admitted that she made up the whole story out of anger towards her landlords. The city of New Orleans was in a state of terror and confusion as one attack after the other occurred. This goes on and on and on. The ax man never robs his victims. He doesn't take a single item from their homes. He is there for one reason and one reason only, to kill. After the Cordomiglia family is attacked, there is another attack on March 13th, then on August 10th, again on September 3rd, and then on October 27th, 1919, there is a final attack after which the Axeman of New Orleans vanishes as quickly as he appeared. As the crimes continued, police and the terrified public begin to believe that the murders might have something to do with the Mafia because most of the victims of the Axeman were Italian immigrants. But after some investigation, no ties between the victims and the Mafia can be found. What cannot be denied is that the attacks seemed to be ethnically motivated and that the Axeman was in fact targeting Italian Americans. He appeared to be seeking women first and foremost and only killed men when they obstructed his attempts to murder women. In several cases, only the woman of the household was murdered. The city was paralyzed with fear and police were inundated with reports from citizens claiming to have seen the Axeman in their neighborhoods or lurking in their yards. They claimed their doors and windows had been tampered with and that they had found chisels and axes around their home. People began carrying loaded shotguns and they created neighborhood watch groups where some would sleep while others would watch over the sleeping. In the midst of this chaos and panic created by the attacks, a terrifying letter comes in to a New Orleans newspaper. It says, Hottest Hell, March 13, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans, the Axeman. They have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible. 
even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them try not to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure that the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. Wow, I thought I had a flair for the dramatic. The letter then details some very specific instructions. Now to be exact, at 1215 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of you people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee, I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed either in fact or realm of fancy. The Axeman. And that is how you become a very legendary serial killer, right? So basically the Axeman says he is a demon. He comes and goes between earth and hell and that he is going to come from hell on Tuesday night, March 19th, to kill again. Everyone who has a jazz band playing in their home on that Tuesday night will be spared and anyone who does not will be killed. This is a serial killer who likes a party and certainly knows how to weave a story. Tuesday, March 19th came. Every jazz musician in New Orleans was booked for a party. Every citizen made plans to be somewhere that had a jazz band. Nightclubs were filled to capacity and everyone with any space in their home hired a band and the neighbors gathered there. The sun set and the music began. Citizen accounts state you could hear jazz music coming from every direction. The people were not taking any chances. If the Axeman wanted them to party, they were going to party. This is such a New Orleans story, right? It's just quintessential, perfect, spot on New Orleans. <laughs> the Axeman must have been satisfied because no one was murdered on the night the city partied. For months, the killer was quiet. The people began to dare to hope it was over. And then August 10th, 1919, Steve Buaka, a grocer is attacked, but survived. Then again on September 3rd, 1919, Sarah Lawman was attacked but survived. And then finally, on October 27th, 1919, Mike Pepitone was attacked in bed at home. His wife awoke to a noise and went into Mike's bedroom to see a large man wielding an ax and fleeing the home. Blood covered not only Mike, but the room, including a picture of the Virgin Mary. Her husband died 
and then the attacks came to an end as suddenly as they had begun. The police searched and hunted and questioned and interviewed, but the Axeman of New Orleans was never found. Now, as intriguing as it is to imagine the Axeman who wrote the letter as an eloquent, cloaked figure stalking the streets of New Orleans in order to promote the arts, most experts don't believe this to be true. Most believe that the letter was not, in fact, even written by the Axeman. Many believe that the Axeman was a common criminal, most likely an uneducated person, and that it was actually someone who wanted to promote jazz music and create a citywide jazz event that had created and sent the letter. Miriam Davis, who wrote The Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story, believes the Axeman may have been suffering from xenophobia. He may have seen Italian immigrants as a threat. A lot of them did very well financially because frankly, they were willing to take jobs that American-born people were not. Davis even has a theory on who it might have been that wrote the letter credited to the Axeman. She thinks a man named John Joseph Davila penned the letter. He was a jazz composer and musician who very quickly after the murders wrote a song entitled The Mysterious Axeman's Jazz Don't Scare Me Papa. He made a ton of money off of that song. So if that's the case and that's what really happened, this would be probably the first viral marketing campaign ever. Oof, that was a little morbid, sorry. Like I said earlier, some believe that the Axeman was a jazz fan, angry that the creators of jazz and Dixieland music were having their ideas and their work stolen from them by musicians and record producers. That doesn't really fit in with why the people being attacked were Italian though. Another theory states that the Axeman was angry that the Navy came into New Orleans and shut down the red light district, Storyville, in 1917. All of the theories are interesting and all of them have validity because none of them have ever been proven. At the end of the two year murder spree, there were 12 total victims, six who survived and six who did not. Of course, these 12 are not the only victims of the Axeman because the attacks also led to false accusations and false convictions. Lives were lost and others were ruined. The Axeman's reach far exceeded those who met the blade of his ax. As time went on after the last attack and another did not occur, the city finally began to breathe a little bit easier. Weeks went by and then months and then years and then finally they knew he was gone. Did he die? Did he move away? Did he go to prison for something else? We will most likely never know. There is one suspect who some feel may very well have been the Axeman of New Orleans. His name was Joseph Mumphrey. The police never knew of this man. He was never a suspect, but in December of 1921, he was shot and killed in the streets of Los Angeles. His killer, a woman dressed all in black and wearing a black veil over her face. It was Esther Pepitone, the widow of Mike Pepitone. Now, Mike Pepitone, remember, was the Axeman's final victim, the man who was killed in October 1919. After Esther shot and killed Joseph Mumphrey in the streets of LA, she was taken into police custody. The story goes that she told police she killed Mumphrey because he was her husband's killer. But there's a problem with this story. Esther actually remarried after Mike Pepitone was killed by the Axeman and the man she remarried to disappeared. Esther was convinced that Joseph Mumphrey was responsible for her second husband's disappearance and that's why she shot him, not because she thought this guy was the Axeman. But because of inaccurate reporting and the way things kind of get twisted over time, some people think she believed Mumphrey was her first husband's killer. In reality, Mumphrey is just one in a very long line of suspects, a line of suspects who may stay suspects forever because unless something very big happens and this case takes a drastic turn, chances are we will never know the man who terrorized the Big Easy who committed the terrible acts and who became forever known as the Axeman of New Orleans. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. 
I sure appreciate you being here. I know there's a lot of things to see on YouTube and a lot of ways you can spend your time. And it means a lot to me that you choose to spend it with me. Don't forget to subscribe if you would like to see more. It helps me so much. Stay safe and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.